This is the Unchained Binge Podcast. I'm Kayla Fretz, and we're going to go deep on Netflix's new Tour de France docuseries, Unchained. Today is episode three, Weight of a Nation. In today's episode, we go to France, deep, deep into France. This is the Frenchest of episodes focused on a national hero in Thibaut Pino, an eccentric manager, Mark Matteo, and a lonely Australian badly in need of some real-life subtitles, Ben O'Connor. Let's get into it. That's a great place to start. Poor Ben O'Connor. Poor Ben O'Connor. Can, can, can we start there with this episode? Uh, as Anglophones, and in fact, I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce uh, a, a new member of our quartet here. Uh, we've subbed out Johnny Long, and we have brought in uh, noted Australian Ian Trellor. Welcome, Ian. Uh, bonjour. <laughs> it's good to be here. <laughs> we know you don't speak French. No, uh, that, also joining it. me, uh, as in the last two episodes, Kit Nicholson. Welcome back. Yeah, it's good to be back. And Abby Mickey, all the way up in Finland at the moment. That's fun. Yeah, I'm at the Finland Gravel event um, oh. put on by Tiffany Cromwell, uh, Val- Valtteri Botas, and... Um, Never heard of him. No, I don't know who he is. And uh, the Steamboat Gravel crew, the team behind Steamboat Gravel, have expanded to include Finland Gravel. Um, looks like a pretty sweet event so far. Well, let's, let's get into a little Netflix here. Poor Ben O'Connor. I do think that is genuinely a, a good place to start in this particular episode. It's not where the actual episode really begins. We're going to go a little bit uh, out of chronological order here. But as an Anglophone, as, as, a, as an English speaker here, I think we all, <laughs> particularly as English speakers, spend a fair amount of time in France with relatively poor French. I think there was a fair amount of empathy, sympathy, for Ben O'Connor in this episode, who is an Australian. He was fourth at the 2021 Tour de France, came back in 2022 and had sort of the the weight of expectation of an entire French team, AG2R, on his shoulders. And he, well, he came to kind of understand what that weight means. Uh, In fact, that's kind of the, that's the thrust of this entire episode is what the weight of being even French adjacent means at the Tour de France. Yeah, I felt really sorry for him. And his perpetually raised eyebrows through the whole episode. She's like, what, wait, what, what, <laughs> what am I, hold on, what? It was, yeah, I felt, I felt for him. Um, he was, he was trying so much to understand both linguistically and also culturally. Yeah. And also just battling through terrible, terrible pain. You you kind of forget that he had such an amazing 2021 Tour de France, actually. Um and uh, I I thought it was interesting, like, kind of watching this series. I don't know if we want to go into, like, real-life bike racing that's happening right now outside of this Netflix series, but watching what's going Brief on mention. in this series with Ben O'Connor and everything while simultaneously having the Dauphiné run, the Criterium de Dauphiné run while this is coming out and watching Ben O'Connor have, like, pretty and a pretty incredible ride uh, at the Criterium de Dauphiné in the lead-up to the 2023 Tour de France. It's really interesting like that, but also like Pino, how this just was a horrible episode, like not a horrible episode for him in that, like I think we got a pretty amazing view of him off the bike, but also like a horrible time for him on the bike. And then you kind of have what he just, he just accomplished at the Giro recently in on the mind. If you're a fan of cycling, if you're watching the racing, um, apart from the Netflix series. Yeah, well, I thought what was interesting was the, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they decided in editing not to include the fact that he'd, hold on, wait a second, did he win a stage in 2021 or 2020? It was 2021, wasn't it? 2021. Which, 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 le- yeah, so the decision not to include that he had actually won a stage, which had helped him get into that position on GC, seemed a little odd to me. If, um, But I guess that was partly to put the emphasis on the general classification and the yellow jersey, uh, but also to add a little bit more to his underdog status in the team and at the race. I feel like they kind of 
they kind of showed they showed when he won the stage in 2021 they just didn't show Did like they say he won it the when he when he was he was kind of crying at the finish and they were holding him and True. they were saying you got you want you were your fourth you're fourth at the tour de france that was the stage he won and so they just didn't mention that he also won that stage when when that mm-hmm. moment was happening um but I think, yeah, that is kind of like to highlight the bigger picture of the tour and that that it is the general cost, which is interesting because you think like with this episode, so much emphasis on Pino wanting to win a stage that they could have mentioned that Ben O'Connor won a stage in 2021. It's true. It's kind of weird to show it and not and not actually mention it. It was it was a stage into teen, uh, so it's sort of a. a pretty large mountain stage i think stage nine and in, in 2021 uh yeah and i believe that those shots were from the finish of that stage it's, they were they're quite close up and so it's it's co- kind of hard to tell but based on his reaction that would be my that would be yeah. my assumption and he was very grimy with weather as well and that was a very very, it was very nasty day. stage yeah so so kind of let's take this all the way back to the beginning so the purpose of this episode is to show us what this race means in France, what it means to French riders, what it means to French managers, what it means, and I think this is the purpose of Ben O'Connor being in it, like I said earlier, what it means to be even associated with one of essentially like the two big French teams, the two big French teams being Groupama FTJ and AG2R Citroën, right? Uh, O'Connor on AG2R, Tipo Pino and Mark Matteo, the manager over on Groupama. So the the episode opens up with this scene from the side of a mountain somewhere. And it's a bunch of fans, right? Like old French, we'll call them mammals, uh, middle-aged men in Lycra. Uh, And they're hanging on the side of the road and they are starstruck, right? They are giddy little children with their phones out as Thibaut Pino just sort of rides by doing his, his regular training ride. It felt like a pretty good way to kind of set the scene for this entire episode. Yeah, it builds nicely to the probably the quote of the episode when Pino, who is evidently quite an eloquent guy, um, saying he's he feels like sometimes um, sometimes it, he feels more popular than he is talented. Des fois, je suis plus aimé que que plus fort en finale. Donc, c'est sûr qu'il y a des jours où je préférerais être moins aimé et gagner plus de courses. And although we hadn't quite got there yet you know that early part of the episode was certainly building up towards him potentially well he was targeting a stage and in the build that we've had in the past two episodes on the trailer there's a lot about you know Pino you can win a stage you can win a stage you're going to win this stage and so I imagine as a newcomer you might think oh maybe this is the day when he's going to this is going to be a huge success but there's it's so it's building up to um it's building up his persona and his popularity but also there's I don't know that his solitary climb um, with his adoring fans at a slight distance. I don't know. There was something quite uh, symbolic about it. I think part of it was also just to show that in France, these guys are like rock stars. Like they, they are what, I don't know, NFL players are in the U.S., uh, I think. I don't watch football um but like these (laughs) pino can't walk through uh, a french airport without getting recognized and i think that part of that was to show what a big deal he is in france like how well known he is and also how well known the groupama fdj jersey is and when you kind of put that next to the ag2 of our citron jersey um that it's really interesting because the two teams are so french but Groupon F- Groupama FDJ is always the first team you think of when you think of a French team. AG2R is the first team you think of when you think of brown bibs. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I was. This episode reminded me just how superior that Groupama kit it was to what they've got now. But anyway, that's just a mm. minor point. I, I love that no, kit. No, you're it, so. Right. I didn't love it to begin with, but it was so much better than it is now. It was such a good kit. Yeah, I agree. I think Thibaut you know, in comparison to other French writers, I mean, perhaps Julian Alaphilippe uh, maybe has that kind of status, but he is kind of the, the romantic hero of French cycling. He is so beloved and 
at the at the 2019 Tour de France, which they didn't really get to in in this episode, but he he won a stage up to the Tourmalet mm. and was looking really good for the GC, and then uh, damaged damaged his thigh late in the race and left the race in tears. And it was like the country had been plunged into national mourning. It was replay after replay of him climbing in a car and then filming through the window and crying, getting a massage and just sad Thibaut Pino sitting there in his boxer shorts weeping for what felt like hours. It's one of my enduring memories of that year's race because it was just so, I mean, it was, it was obviously sad for the race, but it was also so clearly desperately sad for the French. Yeah, I know that they did. I mean, they showed him climbing off the bike as part of the montage of passion, I guess you might call it. And I mean, this episode was full of emotion, passion, and a lot of tears. Um, and that was that was kind of the primer for it, I think. I think it's it's also important to know, or it's it was important for them to get across that Pino is under a lot of pressure um from France as being this like he's he's super loved and um and there's a lot of pressure on him to get results and that he isn't really a GC hope anymore and and so stage wins are all he can get and um so I think part of that opening sequence was also just like there's pressure on him from everywhere pressure from himself pressure from his team pressure from the fans pressure from the nation um, and also, like, uh, Ian, you mentioned he's a rom- romantic cyclist. One of my favorite lines of the whole episode was um, when Matteo described him as a romantic cyclist lost in a modern world, which I thought was really cool. But also, like, Kit, you mentioned the music in the first episode, and I feel like with this with the music, Pino's music was so interesting because it was kind of like, ro- like it it's was like a weird so techno something or other. Yeah, it was it was really modern and really like rock starry, which did not fit with the personality that that we then saw from Pino when he was speaking. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Like, it, it, I think it's not the first instance of the show trying to kind of make you feel a certain way about a character that their personality maybe isn't in line with. Um, Maybe they've learned something from Drive to Survive. I feel like they do a really bad job of making those characters likable. So I think they're trying to go in a different direction with this one. But yeah, I thought the music for Pino was not nearly as French as it needed to be. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure about the music in this this episode. I, I liked that it wasn't cliched and accordion y and, and you know the classic what you might expect from the French episode. Um, but from besides our, the music, our theme song on this podcast, <laughs> well, um, where I where I went into our music library and searched accordion. Okay, and there we go. Saw what came out. <laughs> but we're, we're we're not shy about the cliches. Um, no, no but, we're not. <laughs> but one of my favorite parts of the episode was, and we we're used to Pino being this fairly serious quite often because he's disappointed in himself but this fairly sort of um downtrodden emotional guy not downtrodden all the time but you know he's he's um he's got a lot of passion in him and he is you know by the nature of the sport there's more disappointment than there is success unless your name is Tade Pogacar but um he yeah my favorite part of the episode one of my favorite parts of the episode is when he was wandering around the team bus in a crumpled white t-shirt tucked into his shorts and making jokes with Mark Maddio and the guys on the bus and it was just, he just seemed so brilliantly re- relaxed, which just seemed to contradict what I at least understood about the guy. Mm. I think what the episode doesn't really get into, and maybe what we can add at some additional context around, is it, it kind of points at this, but unless you understand the background, you, you, maybe, you maybe didn't pick up on it, is the difference between a team like Groupama and a team like Yumbo Visma. And the way that they operate quite differently, and like we we saw, we've seen a, a fair amount of Richard Plugo, who's who's the the sort of GM of of Yamba Visma, and he's a he's a quite calculating figure, right? And then we have the contrast with Thibaut Pino describing Mark Matteo as like the mother hen who always protects them and has never let them down, uh, but also definitely not the sort of the same level of of uh, technical focus. <laughs> I mm. guess in a sport that has become increasingly technically focused and and that sort of thing 
these little tiny, you know, the marginal gains era of Team Sky and in, in the sort of 2010s, all that stuff has really changed the sport away from this romanticism and has made it much more difficult for the romantics of the sport to find success, I think. And they didn't really express that that outright in this episode, but that's the underlying theme for me is that like this is the French teams, the French hero are something are kind of from a previous era uh, and they don't necessarily really fit in with the rest of what's happening in the tour all the time uh, to the point where, yeah, you know, French haven't won a Tour de France since 1986 with, with Bernardi. No, they don't look like they're set to, to change that anytime soon. I, I, I liked that as sort of the underlying context. I just don't think that the episode really, it didn't say that outright. You kind of had to know that about cycling to, to get that bit of it. Yeah, what I liked about the, well, I yeah, having watched the past two episodes, we've now been introduced to a few, and they're not all team bosses, but a few of the administration uh, figures at the various teams that we focused on. And in this episode, and it was, you know, I don't think it was contrived. It wasn't, it wasn't a pattern that they manufactured, but the, the idea of family being of key part to the French, well, the sport culture and the cycling culture, and you had it, you know, made explicit, like uh, Pino describing, yeah, <laughs> describing Madio as both a protective dad and a mother hen. And then, of course, you had the uh, family dynamics with the age of DS and his son, and then talking about his father and his mother who weren't able to see his team find success. And there was, so there was that kind of very different dynamic being shown to us, um, which, yeah, I mean, so again, we've got those those figureheads being uh, detailed to us um, that you know coming from somewhere that you might not have expected. I think in the as opposed to riders. I want to get into Julian Jordi in a little bit, who's the director from Edge to R. We see a fair amount of him in this in this episode, but we'll get to that in just a second. I do think it's also worth mentioning, and they don't say this anywhere in the episode, probably because they created this thing possibly before he even announced it. But Thibaut Pino is retiring at the end of the season, at the end of 2023. And so we are about to enter his final Tour de France. And at the 2022 Tour de France, where this was shot, he was definitely, I, I would guess that that's probably where he made that decision, right? And that is that adds an, a level of context to some of what we're seeing as well that didn't make the, the final cut. Again, probably because they didn't really know. But that is that's 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 an interesting. It's an interesting way to look at the uh, at where the sort of the storyline from this episode is going in the in the coming year. I I loved on Pino and kind of seeing the um, bigger picture around this tour. I think one of my favorite parts of the episode was seeing Pino with his goats and with his animals. <laughs> Um, I took a, I took a picture of when he's holding the goat in his full like Groupama outfit, feeding the the baby goat, and he says that he just feels like calmer with his animals or something like that. Like I thought that that was amazing, but also for me demonstrates this behind the scenes look of riders that like even us as journalists following the race, following the riders, following cycling, we. We think we know a, a rider, but we really have no idea what's going on behind the scenes and in their personal lives and when they're at home. And I think being able to see Pino this way in such a raw setting, um, like cleaning his water bottle outside of the barn with all of his baby goats was just amazing, just an amazing moment. I was I was pretty thrilled to see the goats in there. I mean, I've, I've been a Thibaut Pino goat enthusiast for quite a long time um <laughs> and have written about what's it the, in the past and what's the instagram account uh kim kim dot goat i'm pretty sure yeah which is one of the goats not one of the baby goats kim is a, a fully grown goat now uh i i also thought not to get too far into the weeds it was interesting that he specifically called out his goats and his donkeys which is brutal for the two highland cattle that he got uh, a couple of years ago which uh which I would have thought were a clear standout of the of the herd. On the goat front, I also really liked. I I've just learnt that you can watch it in French without overdubs. So there was some dweeb doing an overdub on the version that I was watching, 
where Thibaut Pino was saying, stop putting your feet in there. That's where your food goes. Come on. Um, <laughs> so I, well, let, brief, brief PSA, brief PSA, public service announcement. Uh, it, depending on the, the settings on your own Netflix, when you first start watching this, it might put you into dubbing mode automatically this is what happened to ian he didn't realize that there was anything wrong the better way to watch I, this i think we i'll have correct you decided... i realized that something was wrong i just didn't realize i could fix it <laughs> the, the better way to watch this i think all of us have have decided is to leave it in the original audio the original french or english audio with subtitles so if you're if you're opening up netflix bottom right hand corner there's a little box kind of looks like a comment box you can click on that on the left side, audio, you want French, original, selected. That will leave the English speakers in English. It just leaves everybody in their in their original language, basically. And then subtitles over the right, you can put whatever subtitle you, you want. If you want it in English, you want it in Spanish, whatever, whatever you want. That is the better way to watch this show. And I do think that, that is worth saying on this podcast for Definitely. anybody out there who has missed this opportunity to not have to listen to weird dubbing <laughs> <laughs> dubbing is a very french thing by the way um and i remain convinced that it's part of the reason why uh france in general has has just sort of like a fewer english speakers uh it's sort of like a north south divide in europe that does this where the, all the northern countries do subtitles so imagine what like growing up watching american tv in english with subtitles in your own language like you'd pick up the language pretty you pick up English pretty quickly, right? As opposed to France, where they actually have a rule that everything has to be dubbed into French. Uh, and so all American television has French people saying all the things. Uh, so anyway, that, that, that I think is probably part of why it's done in the way that it is. Uh, but you can turn that off. So please do so, because it's terrible. Uh, I have to imagine that a lot more of the emotion will come through. Like the early scenes with... Mark Maggio hanging out the side of a car, screaming like an absolute lunatic, just has this voice over over the top going, you've got it, man. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. It's real uh, bad. <laughs> turn that off. Turn yeah. it off. Ugh, yeah, I want, I want to hear Maggio screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, this is, we felt like it was worth saying that out loud. Um, but also, this is the kind of weird decisions that could potentially make this show a lot less popular right like if that dubbing ruins some of the emotional moments and it's the automatic setting for a lot of people watching netflix it it's not going to break through for those people right like it's just not and i and i i we're, we're we don't want to go down this rabbit hole right now because we're going to talk about the show as a whole i think right at the at the end of these episodes but it is worth i think highlighting that like this is a problem for the spread of this tv show i think i mean maybe they think that the dubbing is better for an english-speaking audience but the product is so much better in its original form i mean it makes you wonder kind of who the show is targeted at because the french already love the tour de france it's not i don't know if they're gonna have any problem kind of spreading spreading the fan or increasing the fandom of cycling in france um the problem is everywhere else and especially english speaking countries and so y you would want i i guess it depends what their end goal is but you'd assume that their end goal is to get more people interested in cycling and if and the the frenchness of it i feel like is definitely uh is going to detract from that i'm a real um I don't know. I'm I, I'm a big fan of foreign films, and this has been a problem with foreign, the foreign movie market, and I'm talking about so foreign from the perspective of basically the American Academy, um, the Oscars Academy, the Hollywood system. Foreign movies include everything that's not made in the UK or the US, um, and it's, it's been an issue forever. But because people just aren't willing to read subtitles, but it's it makes for such for so much better experience and also much better escapism in my opinion because if you've got to really focus in on what you're not only seeing but I mean essentially reading as well and it doesn't take too much away from the um from the experience if at all but you you know the, the 
when you're speaking, you're not just speaking with sound, you're speaking with your whole body. And when Bob Jungles, for instance, at the end of this episode, starts to talk about how, you know, it means a lot to the team and he's getting choked up and his face is kind of doing this little contortion as his muscles twitch, he's trying not to cry. You don't get, you, you only really get that power when you've got, and he's speaking in English, so it's different, but still, it's an example of how, you know, acting or performing or speaking is not just a, a language thing. And I don't know, it, it, it's a, it's an, I think it's a fight that's going to go on forever and it's not anything that can be fixed. But I just wish people would watch things with subtitles because usually it's a better experience anyway. You can't just pick up your phone and get distracted. All right. That's enough of our PSA. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm going to take a brief break. Hey there. If you've been enjoying the Unchained Binge podcast, you should know that this podcast, like everything else we do here at the Escape Collective, is member funded. That means we're funded by, well, you, if you're already a member. And if you're not, we hope you'll think about becoming one. You can head on over to escapecollective.com slash join to sign up and become part of a pretty awesome community. It's a community that supports this podcast and the others on the Escape Collective podcast network as well as everything that we write about bikes and more over on the escapecollective.com website. It's also a community with a very active Discord channel where we sometimes do live recordings of podcasts, by the way. In other words, there are lots of reasons to sign up. Our monthly memberships start at eleven ninety nine USD, or you can save 30% by signing up annually. We'd love to have you as a member. And again, you can head over to escapecollective.com slash join to find out more and sign up. Another underlying theme of this episode, which I have to say I kind of enjoyed, was some pretty blatant French on French violence. The sort of like the the AG2R Groupama spat. Both of them, Matteo and Julien Jordi, both of them kind of make these little like, you know, elbows in the ribs at the other. Groupama saying, you know, we're the biggest, most French team. AG2R saying, well, we actually win stages. Like they both have a bit of this this kind of rivalry. And I don't I sort of was vaguely aware that this rivalry existed, but I I get the sense based on the fact that both of them brought it up, or maybe this is just purposeful in the edit, that that rivalry between those two teams is actually kind of a bigger deal than I previously thought. Yeah, I wonder. I, I just really like the segue from it's basically as you say, is that we had a lot of focus on Madio and Pino to start with, and then we had, oh, and we are the most French team, and the others aren't quite so much. And then it's like, and here's AG two R, and it was just, this is perfect kind of out. Oh, and here's the you know fighter two has entered the arena. Um, it was yeah, it was brilliant. It definitely raised a smile for me. I wonder if there's a sort of regional component to it as well, because if you're at the Tour de France, there's all of these different fan clubs that pop up, and there's not just those two teams. There's also AKA okay, Sam Sick. Uh, total Energies and Cofidus. Cofidus. Cofidus, of course. I forgot Cofidus. How could I there forget? Are five Cofidus? French teams. Total Energies at least it's is too, in the World Tour, too but that's many. It's a lot. Yeah, but they're they're there. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I I think that they all have their supporters in a way that English language audiences don't support cycling teams. I think uh, we probably more support riders, whereas there seems to be a real fandom for the team. And whether that's based on clubs that feed into them or uh, regional sort of allegiances, I'm not sure. But it is it is something that seems distinct from our experience in the, the Western sphere. I do think, Ian, that there's something to the regionality of these two teams. And it is worth mentioning that, yeah, there's, 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 there's like, there's, well, there's lots of French teams. This episode makes it seem like there's only two there's only two fighters in the ring. There are lots of other French teams, but there is a bit of a of a, of a regional rivalry. Perhaps AG2R has historically been kind of Rhone Alps, kind of well, down near the Alps region. Uh, Groupama has been a little bit more, I guess, sort of northwest up near Paris, um, middle of the middle of the country. I do think that there's a fair amount of kind of regional fandom that happens here and that that is perhaps how the french fans kind of split themselves a little bit 
they also keep riders. They keep the same riders for a good amount of time. I think uh, you know Arno Demar is an example. The sprinter, Group Arm is a sprinter, and T- and Pino. It's slightly different at eighty two R. At least it has been the past few years. But again, they yeah they they have got a real desire to develop French riders. Let's let's focus over on eighty two R. So we talked a lot about Thibaut Pino already. I think the reasons why he was used are, are quite clear. He's a he's a very he's a, he's a tragic figure at this point in in the french yeah in french cycling well i mean like he he could have won the tour de france uh if things had gone slightly differently in 2019 he's definitely sort of fallen down a little bit that kind of narrative i think is is very compelling he also has this whole sort of goat thing and and all the rest of the things uh, sort of surrounding him that are all reasons why Netflix decided to to really slow this episode down and like spend time at a farm and do some things that feel very different from from previous episodes. The other half of this this episode though was AJ2R and Ben O'Connor in Australian and kind of a fish out of water story uh, and also another way to illustrate just how brutal the Tour de France can be. Uh, he did he, he had sort of a deer in a headlights look for for much of this episode and. To be perfectly honest, I don't feel like it painted AG2R as a team in a particularly professional light. I understand that riders riding through pain, riding through injury is something that happens all the time in the Tour de France. And what we probably saw there was not really any different from the way that the sport has operated for a long time. I mean, you could very much argue that Primoz Roglic riding through a separated shoulder across the cobblestones was 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 just as terrible right but seeing it up close and in particular with a rider that was speaking english and was clearly struggling so so desperately was pretty jarring i think i think it was especially jarring i think that there was this conversation going on about whether or not he was going to continue through a very clear language barrier and so it kind of looked like he didn't have a choice and he wasn't going to be able to argue his corner. Um, and I imagine that's probably, well, I like to think that's probably a little bit of, I don't know, overzealous editing um, and that he might have had more to say. But, yeah, it was hard to watch. And, um, yeah, it's it, you know, I'm all for riders cracking on through road rash and, I don't know, Small, uh, even Garen Thomas and his pelvis fracture, when it, which was stable, and um, he, you know, doctors told him he couldn't do any more damage. But Ben O'Connor couldn't lift his leg. I want to get an x ray. Why? Je vu in radio. Oui, oui. Oui. Oh, it's the radio. Fuck me. I went through hell on stage eight just to finish. I was pretty adamant that was it. Um, and he was very clearly in a lot of pain. And that it just made me quite sad. And then, you know, when Jongels did win a stage and that was gave him uh, a green light to leave the race, that didn't sit well with me. Because although I get it, I do, I understand that there's this respect for the race and there's a, you know, we don't give up. And I like that about cycling. Um, you know, we put ourselves into a pain cave and it's deliberate and we can you have to dig deep and push beyond the suffering or whatever. But um, you know, nothing changed for Ben O'Connor when Jungles won the stage. Um, it was just that, oh, the team can now let him go and recover. Yeah, I think it was this, it's this really interesting thing in cycling, right? And you have this debate a lot with kind of the older generation of whether or not the riders are tough. Um, there was this huge conversation around the Giro d'Italia this year in 2023 when a stage was shortened due to weather about that the riders just aren't as tough as they used to be. And it's a really frustrating conversation. Um, like as the partner of a cyclist watching somebody go, somebody go through that much pain and have their team not really allow them to stop. And even as a professional, Uh, I was forced to race with a concussion and, um, had migraines for six weeks afterwards and could barely even get on a bike, but they needed me to be in the race. And so it didn't matter that I crashed and lost my helmet. You know, it's like, that's just kind of part of the old schoolness of cycling. And I think it was interesting with Ben O'Connor. He's like a relatively newer rider. Uh, he's, he's very young compared to, um, a lot of the riders that he's competing against and he 
had clearly had a different mindset when it came to this injury and riding through it and riding through the pain. Um, cause like you always have, I mean, growing up my, whenever I would get injured, my parents would always say, well, Tyler Hamilton rode the tour de France with a broken collarbone. You can, you can do this. You can push through this pain and it, it pisses me off. And so watching this episode pissed me off. Cause I was like, just let Ben go home because this is not helping him at all. And it's not watching. It was like, I don't know. It puts such a bad taste in my mouth. Tyler Hamilton also had to get his teeth capped because he ground them to nothing through that Tour de France uh, because he was riding with a broken collarbone. So I'm not sure that that's really the... I'm not sure that's really what we want to be focused on. My parents love me. My parents love me, though. I shouldn't like say. But it was like, it's like this mindset that they, that you, that was like a very old school mindset of just like, you can push through the pain. And with cycling, that's always, that's always a thing. It's always like something having to do with cycling is like, no matter what injury you have, you can push through it. And the same thing happened when, was it, um, uh, Lawson Craddock rode the entire Tour de France with a broken collarbone in 2020, I believe, 2019. Like, it's not something that's that's gone away by any means, but it's something that I, I hope to see cycling leave behind in the future. And I was really proud of Ben O'Connor for standing up for himself and leaving after Bob took that win. I think he should have been able to leave, you know, the day that he felt he could no longer continue. But it, this is cycling. This is the part of the sport. Yeah, it was really interesting as a comparison with what they'd said about Pino earlier in the episode, you know, when they were talking about his bad luck at previous tours. Um, and of course, there was that, you know, climbing off in 2019 in tears, but then there was his, he crashed on the first stage in 2020. And I think it was Mark Madia who was explaining that you know, Pino had really damaged his back um, and he'd got abrasions all over the place and his morale was really low, but he, uh, he continued the race. But then he lost basically a whole season to the injuries that had been, you know, left to be tortured for three weeks. Um, and so that was a really interesting sort of comparison. And I, I don't know, I would like to think that if I if, if you were watching this for the first time and you picked up on those things, and you're watching that, you know, this was your introduction to cycling. You think that was a slightly odd um, contradiction. And what are Netflix trying to say about this? Um, what light does this actually shine on the culture of cycling? Part of the reason why it was such the whole thing is really interesting to me is because there is so much French influence in this whole show. That's a big part of the reason why we've got Steve Chanel explaining the basics of bike racing in French instead of one of the many, many, many English speaking journalists that could have said the exact same things, right? Like he's not saying anything mind blowing here. He's he's doing the basics for he's 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 playing the Will Buxton kind of figure stuff like that like there's clearly a, a fair amount of french influence in this and then this episode while incredibly sort of romantic and and slow and 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 i think that in from one perspective sort of is like a, oh the, the 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 this older era of professional cycling was was beautiful and these are the teams and the riders that are continuing these traditions <laughs> from the other perspective it just seems really unprofessional and it just really like it doesn't paint either team in a particularly positive light. And I thought, I think that dichotomy is, is fascinating that like, if this is given the French influence of this entire show, clearly the people that made this, I, I don't know if they even believe that they have painted these teams in a negative light. Uh, but they certainly, from my perspective have particularly ag 2 r I, I loved how sort of emotional Julien Jordi got, throughout this episode that's the director sportif of ag2r like he clearly passionately cares about this but then some of the actual decisions that were made were a little bit bonkers there's a really interesting contrast between the two uh the two managers with julian and mark Matteo and how like mark Matteo was a successful cyclist in his career before he became the general manager that we know now um and became the mother hen of a bunch of little cyclists tw waddling around versus like julian he never had as successful a cycling career he said in the episode like he never got to race the tour de france but he is now a 
huge part of a team that is successful at the Tour de France. And I think it's interesting the two different career paths before and how they influence the two guys as managers of teams. I don't think you'd ever see Mark Matteo plastered in tattoos of the team winning the team classification, um, which is like almost a consolation prize in the Tour de France. I, I wish it was a bigger deal um, because cycling is a team sport and it and that definitely gets lost uh, a lot of the time. And the only time you ever stand on the podium with your teammates is when you've won a TTT, which is very rare. So as, as someone who raced, it's the most beautiful moments I've ever had are standing on the podium with my team, but it's the team prize is, is like basically, um, not, it's the Movistar prize, the only team in the tour de France that even cares about the team classification apart from (laughs) Julian is, is Movistar. Um, and so that he has that tattooed on him along with a bunch of other like cycling related tattoos is I think a really interesting dynamic, the two of them and how their teams are run and also like how they approach riders with injury, uh, thinking to the, to how that's going to impact the future versus how it's going to impact tomorrow. Um, I, I found that really fascinating. What about Bob Jungles? Well, he, Bob Jungles kind of saves the day for this French team. I mean, the other angle of this is you've got you've got these two French teams that are competing for Frenchness, and then AJ Tuar clearly loses that battle because the two riders that we see most often are not French. One is from Luxembourg, <laughs> Bob Jungles, and the other is from Australia, Ben O'Connor. Yeah, that was that was nice to see. I I think that the way that they framed Bob Jungles within the the whole of the episode was kind of interesting because it across the the three episodes to date COVID is not a factor COVID apart from the fact that people are wearing masks is largely removed from the um, narrative Bob Jungles almost didn't start the tour because he was positive for COVID and controversially just snuck in uh, on on some sort of technicality of of what level of virality he had and I, I think that any of that kind of backstory was interesting to be omitted. Um, I'll be curious to see how they get into things on episode four, because we're about to come up to a rest day where, spoiler alert, a lot of people went home with COVID. Um, whether they bring that up, I'm, I'm not sure. We'll find out. But it's it's certainly been interesting as somebody that was at that race where everyone was walking around with masks and there was this uh, ever-present sort of fear of people getting sick hanging over the entire thing that they've chosen to to remove that narrative most of these episodes so far have yes they focused on particular teams they've also focused on sort of a particular stage or stages in the race in this episode we get a bit of the bob Jungle's stage win we also get this this heavy focus on planche de belfi that's kind of the the structure underneath which the whole Thibaut Pino segment is created, right? Is that they're in his home region. He rides Planche de Belfi a dozen times a year. Uh, he really wants to win this particular stage. He doesn't. I, I mean, basically, like, part of the problem with that is the Planche de Belfi is so steep and so difficult that it really just becomes a power test, and, and the strongest riders were always going to win on that unless he managed to get in a breakaway or something. Thibaut Pino is just not that rider anymore. Now, last couple episodes, we've, we've sort of dug into what's happening around what we're seeing on on TV, it, that's a little bit difficult in this one because we're, we're the actual events in question step quite a bit out of the chronology of the actual Tour de France. Uh, but Planche de Belfi, for example, is there anything worth mentioning that we didn't see in this episode? Uh, keeping in mind that we might come back to Planche de Belfi in a future episode. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. I don't have a point on that particular question, what happened outside of it, but I thought to, well, to support what we were saying earlier about the different management styles with Mark Maddio going and talking to Pino's family afterwards. And there was clearly, you know, it's it's not just within the team and the riders. They all know each other's families. And maybe it's exclusive to Pino because he's such a character. But I found that bit interesting as well because, I don't know, I'm sure there are some personalities like Roglic's family who are very much involved, but... Yeah, I found that quite interesting and very much more relaxed. Um, maybe again, shedding light on 
Guy Palmer being a bit behind the times romantic. I think in regards to Planche de Belfi and also like knowing what is to come in the series because we've watched the race already. One of my favorite quotes um, from the episode was when Pino was talking about mountains and he says, I feel small at the base and big at the summit, which um, we've, we've seen them race across flats. We've seen crashes. We've seen them race through the cobbles, but up to this point in the series, we haven't seen what mountains what role mountains play in the Tour de France, which is obviously a massive part of the race and uh, and the general classification and Pino uh, being one of the best French climbers. He doesn't look like a climber. He's got like really, he's got like swimmer shoulders. It's hilarious. Um, but I found that quote like really beautiful. And also as a, it's, it's a very good uh, like tie into what we're going to watch later on in the series. Speaking of ties into the rest of the series, one thing that was interesting that we didn't see in the Groupama section was the David Godou element. Um, and we're, I think we, I don't know if it was after last year's tour or just before, but the debate about that relationship within the team of Godou and Pino, Godou being the new GC favourite for that team. And so we get to see him in the last five minutes um, and he's all chirpy on his uh, on his rollers. Uh, I think he calls Michael Storer Mish Mish. Um, and then, so it's this, like we were saying in previous episode, it's introducing another character that we're, do- we're going to see further down the line. And I wonder if we're going to get that that beef again, um, which is already building towards this next tour. Oh, I love Go- Godou. I, I mean, that there's a character that I'm sure, so, so, you know, Netflix is coming back to shoot more at the 2023 Tour de France that's about to start. I guarantee that Godou is going to be Definitely. heavy part of that and 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 you know character development starting with the first series and extending into the second series would make a lot of sense there so this episode it's the french episode what was the what was the underlying purpose of this of this episode within the sort of scope of the whole series and and did it work like did this episode work for all of you what i liked about it was the different structure that it had I mean again it's got two teams um, and they offset one another quite neatly for obvious reasons in this case but um, it had like you mentioned Kaylee it was slightly slower paced Um, uh, I mean it's music wasn't doesn't quite fit with this analogy but it was almost slightly art housey especially with its ending with Ben O'Connor sitting alone um, eating his breakfast or lunch or whatever before getting on a flight there was that kind of slightly downbeat ending but mostly it sets the context for the whole Tour de France and the history of the race or the sort of the wider context in its culture and you know what it means to race the Tour um, as opposed to what's actually happening on the day. I I think for cycling fans as well this is one which is a real draw card because with Jumbo Visma it was this team of sort of superhumans that they were presented as, especially Wout Van Aert, where it's almost like they're sports cars. Like that human element is a little bit removed. Whereas with this, it's clearly clearly people with deep emotional ties to the sport and huge emotional reactions to what's going on around them. And I, I think that that appeals to the romantic in that uh, sort of, older era of, of cyclists and cycling fans. Um, I think it also brings it into a, a, a greater lineage of the race rather than it just being some manufactured. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's certainly a little bit more nuanced and, and well-rounded in its portrayal. This episode really got across to me, or like I already knew that, it's a this race is a massive deal in France. It's been going on for a really long time and the French you know, they have holidays around this time and there's so many French people who follow the race for the entire 3 weeks and stand on the and camp on the sidelines and go and like camp on these massive climbs for days before the race comes through and we didn't we we don't really get to see that yet. I don't know if we're going to see it in the series or if they're going to highlight that in the future when we get to kind of the bigger mountain stages but i think it does set the scene for for france in relation to the tour and um 
And I think it checks a lot of boxes in terms of this being a show that is not necessarily for English speaking fans, um, but is French friendly, French fan friendly. I mean, having Thibaut Pino it is is always going to be helpful on that front. So, well, love the goats, yeah. Love the goats, love the goats. I, I mean, I enjoyed this episode for very different reasons than I've enjoyed some of the other ones. Very little, sort of, in the way of of anything racing related. Uh, didn't learn a whole lot that we sort of didn't already know, other than some of the dynamics between, like, rider and manager and things like that. But like. The relationship between Ben O'Connor and Julian Jardy is not something that I was really wondering about, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> uh, and and, but I do think that the the episode served its function. It showed, it showed sort of the the passion of the French people and the passion of of the whole country for this race. It also showed how ridiculously hard it is and and what some of these riders go through to try to continue. Those were the two sort of underlying themes for me and. It was successful there. I hope that in future episodes they kind of get back into a little bit more about the actual bike race. Uh, I, I think that the, the sort of the, the Planche de Belfi, Thibaut Pino storyline was a, just a bit of a flop, right? Because he didn't even really, you know, he got dropped like the second it got hard. <laughs> so that storyline, that, that sort of the first half of the episode I was all building toward, felt like it just sort of disappeared and, and we moved into AG2R. So that bit was a bit weird. It's funny, like, given that this was a super French episode, the, the Frenchest French episode that we've had so far in the series, and that by the time the episode ended, I was just like, oh, man, I love Ben O'Connor, and I'm so sad that he's going home because now he won't be in the rest of the series. <laughs> and like you said before, Abby, and he's, uh, what was it, Kit was saying this, that, that he's doing quite well right now. Uh, he's second overall right as- at the Dauphiné right now, yeah, which is like the... Yeah one of the big lead up races into the tour de France. There's two week long stage races that all of the, most of the GC contenders for the tour de France go to before the tour de France for those who, I don't know, don't follow cycling and, and they're getting into it because of the Netflix series. Um, we're in the build up right now as the series comes out on June 9th, mid June. Um, and he's, he's second overall right now behind Jonas Vinegar. So Vinigo. So he's, um, he's riding quite well. Um, and it's exciting to see like the two things next to each other. It's interesting. It'd be interesting. We should we should chat with Ben O'Connor about uh, the reception he's getting after this thing launched. I think that would be a fascinating story for us to run over on Escape Collective. Uh, you know, has he increased his Instagram followership in the in the in the last week? I don't know. Uh, all right. Well, it's time. It is time for us to. Well, it's time for us to wrap up today's episode we'll be back with episode four here in not too long episode four is focused well the actual name of the episode attack counterattack and uh based on the little bit that i have perused it looks like we go back to planche de belfi and we get a bit from pogacha and Jonas vingago so that should be an excellent episode as a reminder This podcast, all the podcasts we make here at Escape Collective, they're all supported by members. And so if you are not already a member, head over to escapecollective.com slash join. That will, well, that'll get you all the content that we make from the Tour de France. If you are either a new fan or just a massive Tour de France fan, make sure that you're signed up so that you don't miss anything throughout July. We'll be back with another episode of the Unchained Binge podcast very soon. (laughs) Ta-ta. <laughs> Au revoir. A demain. A demain.